into the family of God. The Bible calls it being born again. Not of blood, not of the will of man, of the will of the flesh. Born of God. As the Holy Spirit moves into our lives and changes us. And uh, boy, what a moment that is. I hope you've been born again. How exciting it is to know Him as our Father. Live in that relationship. We're going to sing a song about that here this morning. By the Father's mercy, set apart to serve His Son, sanctified by His own Spirit, raised the Holy Three in one, saved by resurrection power, shielded in His faith. story. We hear and we often repeat a, a similar phrase 
to this one where we say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And truly, a picture is something that expresses much. It can say uh, and tell us so much. There's some paintings that I have seen. I saw a picture of, of, of an artist's rendition of Peter and John running to the tomb. And just the expression on their face and, and, and the way in which they're moving, you can see it, it's kind of this blend of curiosity, this blend of hope, this blend of excitement, at the same time, wonder. And, and really, just looking at that picture, you get so much more out of, out of just, you know, if somebody were to just share some words with you. But you know, a picture is not just something that's painted, but we have a master artist in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the pictures that he would paint would often come in the forms of stories, what we call parables. And these parables would paint for us a picture which would help us to understand a great deal more than what we can get out of just simple words. For instance, today I can tell you that God loves you. Well, how much? And, and, and what kind of a love is it? Well, I want to speak to you today about that. The Father's love, as we see it revealed in this parable, Luke chapter 15. But as we think and re reflect on the Father's love today, I also want us this morning to know how to respond to the Father's love. And ultimately, how we ourselves can reveal God's love to others. Let's consider this today in Luke chapter 15, the Father's love. Let's ask the Lord's help as we enter into this time that He would speak to each heart. And use these moments for His glory. Let's pray. Father, we come to You today. And Lord, as we sang a little while ago, we stand amazed. Lord, to know that You would die for us. Lord, how marvelous, how wonderful is Your love. And yet, Father, we read in Your Word that it is a love that passes knowledge. Something that we can't fully grasp in and of ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit to be able to bring these truths home to us today. Lord, I ask that He would do that. Lord, help us all today to be able to marvel at Your love for us, not only collectively, but Lord, Your love for us individually. And Father, today I pray that You would help us as Your people to respond to Your love and to reveal that love to others by the way that we love them. Lord, today we ask that You would do this for Your glory, by Your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In this passage, the first thing that I want us to note here, we read verses 21 down to verse 25, and, and, and I, do, I want us to again refresh our memories on what this passage is all about. Jesus here is teaching some people, he's teaching the Jewish people about how God loves them, and how God loves the individual. This chapter, Luke 15, is one that's very familiar. There's actually three parables that Jesus Christ gives. He gives a parable of a shepherd who has a hundred sheep, and one of them is missing, and how the shepherd leaves the ninety-nine in the fold and goes and searches and, and finds that one sheep and brings it back with a heart of rejoicing with those other ninety-nine. He says, likewise, there's joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. He goes on to give us a second parable. He tells us a parable about how a woman who had a coin, and, and what would be similar today would be a wedding ring, and she has lost that coin and she can't find it anywhere so she goes throughout the whole house searching and searching and searching until she's able to find it and when she does how it thrills her heart how she rejoices and calls the neighbors and says look at what I found oh she's so excited the Lord Jesus Christ says again there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents and then he comes into this third passage and he spends a lot more time in this story developing a story of how a young man growing up in the father's home, growing up under the care and the provision and the protection of his father's house, yet as he comes to age, perhaps at 18, perhaps at 21, he goes to his father and he says, Father, give me the inheritance that's due to me. I'm tired of living here. I want to go out and make my own way in this world. And so the father gives him a good inheritance. The son goes out and he squanders everything. He spends it out in gambling. He spends it out on drink. He spends it out running around with prostitutes. And there he finally runs out of money. And as he runs out of money, a famine hits. As that famine comes, he has nothing to eat. All those ones who'd been his friends while he had money, they didn't care for him. And they wouldn't give anything to him. And so there he was left all alone. He's forced to go and work feeding the pigs. 
going out and slopping the pigs. Now you'll remember in the Jewish culture that pigs were the dirtiest, most unclean, most abominable creatures that there are. Not just because they were unclean and not Jews weren't permitted to eat them, but because back about 150 years before Jesus had lived, a man had come through and there in Jerusalem he had defeated the Jewish armies and he had sacrificed a pig at the altar and spread that blood all through the temple to the Jewish people, their minds to go out and feed the pigs and, and, and to work with the pigs is an abominable thing, but that's what this young man finds himself doing. And as he's slopping the pigs, he gets so hungry that he says, I'm going I'm to eat some of this stuff. And as he's there, the Bible tells us that he comes to himself and says, what am I doing here? My father has servants at home and, and they don't have to eat the pig slop. If I could just be one of those servants, if I could just be a, a slave to my father, I'd be so much better off. And he says, I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to tell him how I sinned against him, how I sinned against heaven. And just to accept me, not as a son, but just let me be a servant. And so he runs back to his father. When that son is just a great ways off still, the father sees him and he runs out to meet him. And he embraces him, he brings him into the home, not as a servant, but as a son. You now we look at this passage, and this passage is one that causes us to reflect on the love of our Father for us. Consider here, first of all, the Father's love for us from the very beginning of our being. It's implied in this passage, though it's not something given to us in great detail. We find in verse number 12, uh, as a certain man had two sons, the younger one of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Using this story that Christ has told us as an analogy, that prodigal son had been cared for in the father's love from the beginning of his life. All of his daily needs had been met. The father had sheltered him. The father had fed him. The father had clothed him. No doubt the father had seen to his education. The father had looked after his health. The father had cared for him in his growth, not only physically, but his growth as a man. All these things the father had cared for this young man from the moment he took his first breath. Likewise, our Heavenly Father has cared for us from the very beginning of our existence. Even before that, we read in Psalm 139, verses 13 and following, speaking of the Lord, Thou hast possessed my reins, my inward parts. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise Thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are Thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously, intricately wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Jesus in the New Testament, he spoke not just of how the Father cared for us in our mother's womb, but there he spoke of how the Father feeds the sparrow, of how he clothes nature, and he tells us, doesn't your Father care about you much more than any of them? Amen. Oh, we find over and over again he's cared for us all through our lives. In fact, he tells us the Father knows the very number of hairs that are on your head. Now why? Why does He know us this way? Why does He provide for us like this? Why does He care for us in such minute details? It's His love for us. Amen. From the very beginning of our being, in His love, He has fashioned each and every one of us as unique human beings. I'm excited to meet this newest one that's going to come into my family. You know what? I know she's not going to be a replicant of anybody else. Because our God fashions us each individually with a unique personality because He cares and loves us all as individuals. And it's been that way from the very beginning. Amen. The Bible tells us He loved us even before we were ever conceived. So much so that Jesus Christ was slain from the foundation of the world to provide redemption for our souls. In this passage, we note the father's love from the very beginning of this prodigal son. But notice also, we consider his love while that son was astray. Even while that son was gone away from home, even while that son was in sin. We look at this passage, and this passage teaches us a little bit about how God sees each and every one of us. How God sees a sinner without Jesus Christ. You'll notice this young man, this son who runs away from home, who takes all that his father had provided and squanders it. You'll notice, first of all, his idolatry. He worshipped himself more than he worshipped God. It was about what would please him. It was about what could bring him happiness in his life. He was all about himself. And every one of us have lived selfishly 
Every one of us here have been idolaters in that sense. Furthermore, in this passage, we see not only his idolatry, but we see his ingratitude. We find in verse number 12, as this young man looks at his father, he says, give me, give me. All his life his father had been giving to him and giving to him and giving to him again. And yet he looks up at his father and he doesn't say, what can I give to you? He says, give me the ingratitude of this young man. All that his father had bestowed upon him and yet how he lived so selfishly. What ingratitude. Notice in this passage also he went off, the Bible tells us. It says in verse number 13, he wasted his substance in that riotous in that debauched lifestyle. He went out and squandered it all. And I want you to know that everything that he threw away was an investment that his father had made. Right. It wasn't anything that he had gotten for himself. He wasted everything his father had given him. And today when someone goes out and lives in sin, they're not just wasting their life. They're wasting the love and the goodness of God to them. Amen. This young man lived that idolatrous ingratitude, that investment squandered, and we see his irreverence for God as well. To go out and to slop hogs. Yeah. The abominable thing. You know, in this passage, we get a picture of what God sees when he sees a sinner apart from Jesus Christ. We like to think of ourselves as somebody, oh, I'm pretty special. I, I, I've got a lot to offer God. I, I'm a pretty good guy. But without Jesus Christ, we're nothing but idolatrous, ungrateful Sinners. And until we come to grips with that, we'll never truly appreciate and understand and embrace the love of God. But in this passage, even though the Son was in such straits, consider our God's actions toward us as sinners. Notice, first of all, we see in verse number 20, we see that the Father still longed for this boy. The father still longed for this boy. It tells us that as that son arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. His father was looking for him. His father was waiting for him. His father was hoping for him. I'm so glad that even though I was a sinner, even I'm so glad that even though I've turned my back on the Lord and all we like sheep have gone astray, I'm so glad that though I ran off into sin, I'm so glad that still I had a Father in Heaven who wanted to see me come home. Amen. He longed for me. And this passage tells us not only that He longed for me, but Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, it tells us that He sought for me. Fact is, I would never have come to Jesus Christ except for the fact that He came after me. Amen. Jesus' own mission when He came to this life, I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. You're here today because He's after you if you're not saved. He's still seeking for you. He's still calling for you. And as He longs for you, and as He seeks for you, He invites you to Himself. We find over and over again some of the sweetest words in all of Scripture they're spoken in Isaiah. They're spoken by Jesus in Matthew. This is the last message that's given to us in Revelation 22. Is this simple word. Come. Come. All you've got to do is come. Let him that is a thirst come. Let him have the water of life freely. You want something to satisfy your soul? Come and I'll give that which satisfies your soul. You're looking for rest? Jesus says come unto me. I'll give you rest. You're looking for forgiveness of your sin? Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sin be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Amen. Oh, look at the Father's love for us, even while we're in our sin, that He would long for us, that He would seek for us, that He would invite us to Himself. Amen. We look at this passage, and we see the Father's love, not just from the beginning of our being, and not just when we're astray, but oh, how His love is revealed when we come to Him. That's the verses that we read. We see it in verse 20. It says, He arose, He came to His Father, but when He was yet a great way off, His Father saw Him and had compassion and ran and fell on His neck and kissed Him. The Son said unto Him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and Thy sight. I'm no more worthy to be called Thy Son. But the Father said to His servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on Him. Put a ring on His hand. Shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, 
And they began to be merry. You know that when we come to Jesus Christ, He doesn't hold us at a distance. He doesn't keep us away. I can remember when we looked at this story once in a men's prayer breakfast when I was in Illinois. And somebody spoke up and they said, you know, I, I can appreciate how the older son, and we'll look out in a few moments, how he, he felt kind of neglected in all of this. And, and how he was, was not okay with the father embracing him. I mean, after all, if he would go and live in that sin, then he has no right back into the father's house. But you know what? He's right. We don't have any right. But when we come to the father, in spite of what we've done, he doesn't hold us off. He doesn't give us one of those guy hugs, you know. He embraces us. He gave him a kiss. He said, this is my son. This is my son. Forgiving our sins. This passage, the son came to him speaking of the wrong that he had done. But when he came to his father, the father spoke not what of what he had done. But he spoke rather of what he had made him. When we come by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, our relationship to God is transformed. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, no longer is it a relationship of sinner to judge. Now you're in relationship with father to son. And that's what he wants us to embrace. And that's what he wants us to realize. I'm a child of God today. And singing that song a few minutes ago, I'm a child of the king. What a thrill of hearts. Oh, what forgiveness he has. Notice in this passage how he provides the very best. That prodigal deserved the song. So do each and every one of us. That's not what the father gives. The father to his son, he came and he brought out the best. Picture yourself at that dinner. Imagine yourself there as the prodigal. As you look all about you, you look down at your hand and you've got this shiny ring on your hand. You look at your clothes and there's your clothes, just this shining garment, brand new. You've been cleaned up. You've got new shoes on your feet. You smell that aroma. You've had steak and eggs for breakfast. You've had prime rib for lunch. And now it's filet and gone for supper. I mean, he's giving you the very best of everything that he has. And you sit there and you look at the joy of the servants. And most of all, you look down at the Father. And he says, it's so good to have you home. Amen. One day... You'll know what it's like. In fact, the dinner's being prepared even now. And one day we're going to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to look across that table at one another. We're going to look down at those rings we have on our hands. We're going to look at the shining garments that we've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We'll see across there to those eyes and those hands that were given for us. And we'll hear those words. I'm so glad you're home. So glad you're home. Amen. What love. We look at this passage. And we see the rejoicing. Excitement. Verse 7 again. He says the words. Jesus says, I say unto you likewise. Joy shall be in heaven. Over one sinner. That repents. More than over ninety and nine just persons. Which need no repentance. Again in verse number 10, and I just love the way it's said. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And you'll see there is not the angels rejoicing. There's rejoicing in their presence because it's the Father rejoicing. He's excited to have you. He's rejoicing over you. To hold you up, to point you out. You know, I can remember my grandmother. And she had this license plate on the front of her car. And you know what it said? Let me tell you about my grandchildren. She rejoiced over us. Every time I saw her, it was a big hug. I love you. You know what? That's the way our Father is with us. I love you. Let me tell you about my children. Oh, how He rejoices over us. What incredible love. Can I say this morning, His love is unquestionable. His love is undeniable. How often do men question the love of God? I've had numerous men and women look at me and declare, there is no God, at least not a loving God that you talk about. If there is a God, He doesn't care for us. Now, a large part of that declaration springs from rebellion. 
man doesn't want there to be a God because he doesn't want to be accountable to that God. But there's another part of that declaration that springs from the distorted view of God and His love. Some people today look at God and they think of Him almost like the entertainment coordinator on a cruise ship, just there to give them a good time. And if ever things aren't going well, well, it's always God's fault. Some people look at God and they think of Him like Santa Claus. He just kind of watches over you, sees you when you're sleeping, knows when you're awake, and knows if you've been bad or good. So he'll be good, for goodness sake. And he'll give gifts, and he's just a nice, jolly guy. That's not the love of God. He's a holy, righteous God. His love is not that's going to keep us from suffering, because suffering sometimes is what's best for us, because we're going to try. That's what we come for, this goal. It's a purifying effect in that suffering, but here's the love of God. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died. God so loved the world, not that He overlooked our sin, but that He became sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Where every moment of your life filled with suffering, should every hour be filled with pain, if the sun never shined on you on your home, if you were abandoned by every being on this planet and left to die alone, God loves you. And the cross makes that fact irrefutable. Took your place, suffering for your sin, so that you might enjoy an eternity free of suffering, free of sin, replete with joy and gladness, lived in an endless day in perfect peace. The cross declares that it's an inescapable declaration God is love. And God loves you. His love is unquestionable, His love is unfathomable. Marvel again, Romans 5, verses 7 and 8. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet for adventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I remember speaking to a youth group in Illinois, and I was talking to them. I said, imagine today you stood out on the roadside, and this was shortly after September 11th, and I said, there in the middle of the road, tied to a chair, was Osama bin Laden. And you saw, uh, uh, you saw a big 18-wheeler plunging right down the road, heading straight towards him. And you only had time to knock him out of the side and take that full force of that 18-wheeler for, it, for, it, uh, for him. And that's the only way you could save him. Would you do it? Everybody said, not on your life. <laughs> There's no way I would die for him. In fact, he deserves that and much worse. You know what, today? You look at Jesus Christ, he could have said, he deserves hell. That Jared Gritton, he deserves hell. He's broken every law in the book. He's guilty. But instead, he came and he pushed me out of the way of the wrath of God. And he bore the full brunt of it himself. He gave his life in my place so that I might live simply by believing on what he has done. His love is unfathomable. Can I also say today, His love is unexplainable. Amen. If I could bring before you today the greatest orator to speak on the love of God, the greatest artist to picture the love of God, the greatest choir and orchestra to sing of the love of God, the greatest teacher to explain the love of God, we could never do God's love justice. For we to, as the song says, if we could with ink the ocean fill, and, and were the sky made of parchment, were every stalk on earth a quill, and, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God would drain the ocean dry, and the scrolls could never contain the whole, those stretch from sky to sky. We could never fully describe it. We could never completely explain it. In fact, it's interesting if you looked at Ephesians chapter 3. You can't even begin to understand God's love for you without the Holy Spirit empowering you. Right. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will uh, give you strength and be strengthened in the inner man. And that the Christ would dwell in your heart by faith. That then you could begin to understand what is the breadth of God's love. What is the length of God's love. What is the depth of God's love. And what is the height of God's love. As Ephesians 3.19 says, it's a love that passes knowledge. There are some things that you just cannot know. Until you experience it for yourself. Amen. 
I can remember talking with men about their wedding day, and before I was married, I would just try to imagine the emotions. What would it be like to stand there? You know, the excitement, the anticipation. And I could, I could try to picture it in my mind, and I know going up to my wedding day, I was, I was excited about the day, but when you're finally standing there, and you see all those ones walk in, and you hear that music start to play, and the doors in the back of the auditorium open up. I'll tell you, it's a feeling I can't explain to you completely. Amen. You just have to experience it to understand it. One day, the gates of heaven are going to open to you. Amen. And one day, we're going to see the Lamb of God. And one day, we're going to sit down at His table. I can't even begin to explain to you completely. I can't even understand it fully myself today. But one day, we'll be in the presence of a God who loves us. Amen. And will love us for all of eternity. Amen. And only then will we begin to understand. Oh, we look at this passage. It causes us to reflect on the Father's love. But I also want us to think today of how then we ought to respond to the Father's love. As we look here and we put ourselves in the shoes of the prodigal, the first thing that I want us to say is responding to the Father's love ought to first of all bring us to repentance. This passage is what all through Luke chapter 15 where the sinner is said to repent. Yeah. We're told in verses 7 and verse number 2 that there is joy over one sinner who repented. To repent means, as the Bible tells us, the, the, the Greek word metanoia means to have a change of mind. It always results in a change of action. It's not the action. Those are the fruits of repentance, but it's a change of heart. It is always accompanied by faith, believing God and what He has said, believing on Jesus Christ for salvation. Here we find this individual in Luke chapter 15. You can see the repentance of him. It tells us in verse 17 that while he was living in this life of sin, it tells us in verse 17, when he came to himself, when he finally started to realize and think in his mind of what he had done, of what he had become, repentance starts to work. He finally starts to think. Think things through right. If you're here today and you say, I'm a good person, God will accept me because I haven't done anything bad, you're deceiving yourself. God's already told you. All is sin and comes short of the glory of God. God doesn't buy it. You'll wake up in a devil's hell one day unless you come to this place where you come to yourself and you say, I am a sinner in the sight of a holy God. I don't measure up to His righteous standards. I deserve the pit of hell. He came to Himself, the Bible tells us. But notice that repentance, it goes on. Repentance isn't just thinking the right way, but it involves the will. He says in verse 18, I will arise. He made a choice. Every one of us, we have emotions. The Bible talks about our heart and it's made up of our emotions and our, and our, our reasoning, but also our will. And you can think the right thoughts all the day, but until you say, I'm going to Jesus, there's no salvation. Until you make that choice, until you truly repent, our repentance is so vital. Jesus preached it. The greatest messenger of love made this declaration, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Have you come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ? Has there been this time in your life where you saw, hey, I'm a sinner, just like that son who ran away from home. I'm a sinner and I need his forgiveness. I need Jesus as my Savior. Has there been such repentance in your life? Our repentance is never complete. Understand this until we've trusted Christ for the saving of our soul. You know what the problem with too many is that they're chewing on the husks of self-righteousness. I don't need anything is what they think to themselves. I'm alright, but if you don't drop that attitude, if you don't measure yourself against a holy God, you'll find out one day that you're a sinner in the sight of a holy God. And there's one thing that he can say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew. His love has made it possible sins to be forgiven. In His love, He invites you to come and to be His child. But you must go. You must take Him at His word. You must repent and believe. Every man and woman who has ever lived understand this. 
is this prodigal son. We often talk about, well, he's a prodigal. You know what? I'm a prodigal. I'm a prodigal. I needed Jesus and I needed his forgiveness in the worst way. Praise God when I ran to the Father through Jesus Christ. He embraced me and made me his own. And he'll do the same for you. How do you respond to the love of the Father? You do so with repentance. How do you respond to the love of the Father? You do so by rejoicing. How would the prodigal react on this occasion? What do you suppose was in his heart? I wonder as he ran to the Father, what was in his mind? Well, no doubt there was some trepidation. Well, what would he say to me? What's he going to do to me? I, is he going to turn his back on me? Is he going to push me away? What's going to happen? And yet to get to him and to have him embrace and to feel that warmth, to feel that hug. Oh, how tightly his father must have squeezed him. What would that do to that prodigal son's heart? To look around and to see his father rejoicing. Oh, how his heart must have just been filled with gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't deserve any of this. Thank you. You're so good to me. Oh, how he must have rejoiced. Rejoice in the Lord always, the Bible says. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice that your sins are forgiven. Rejoice that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Rejoice in this new life the Father's freely bestowed. Behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us that we should be called the sons of God. Rejoice! What a, what a salvation we have. How do we respond? We respond by pursuing His relationship. Before the prodigal would run away, he wanted nothing to do with his dad. But how would he respond now? How would he respond? How much longer would he stay at the table and just talk to his dad? How much longer would he just want to spend that time in company with his father, the one who's loved him? That relationship. Here the father tells us in verse number 22. I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse number 24. For this my son. There's relationship now. For the first time in the prodigal's life, he's brought into this relationship and knowing his father in a way he'd never known him before. Our God has brought us into a relationship with him, not merely as servants, but as a son. He delights in us. He directs us. He desires to bless us. How desperately, how urgently, how devotedly do we pursue this relationship with him? Do we awake in the morning and just say, Father... Thank you for this day that you have made. Let me just be your child today. Let me just serve you today. Let me just walk with you and know you today. Father, smile on me today. Let me abide in your presence. Tell me what you want for me to do. Show me where you want for me to go. Let me, let me hear from you in your word today. Do we love our, do we love our Father? Do we respond in relationship? Furthermore, how do we respond to that love? Will we be ready to serve? How would this prodigal serve after this moment? With what energy and enthusiasm? With what motivation? With what security? I suppose we could have asked him and, and the prodigal could say to us today, well, it, it used to be that, that what the father asked was too much. It, it used to be that, that what the father asked was boring. It, it used to be that what the father asked was, was too restrictive. His rules were overbearing. Then I discovered that all the Father asked was for my good. Yeah. I discovered the Father's rules are for my protection. I discovered that real joy, real purpose, real meaning was found as I trust and obey the Father. In honoring Him, I find freedom. Freedom from worry, freedom from guilt, freedom from sin's destructiveness. In Him, I find peace and joy. Yeah. This relationship. I'm ready to serve. I can hear the Son. Can't you hear the next Father? The next morning Father? Can I get you your breakfast? Amen. Father, how do you like your coffee? Father, what can I do for you today? Amen. There's some cattle out there that you need me to check on. Is there something I can do? Can I do some house cleaning? What can I do for you, Father? What can I do for you, Daddy? I just want to please you. Amen. Imagine how we lived. How then are we to live? If he has saved us and brought us into this relationship. Amen. I finally conclude with this thought today. And that is, how do we reveal God's love to others? 
interesting twist in this passage is how Jesus now carries this thought further and speaks of another son. He tells us in verse 25, now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brothers come, thy fathers killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. He said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was me, it was fitting that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. Every time I read this passage, it just stands out to me. The contrast between the heart of the Father and the heart of the Son. Amen. They're so different. Such a different reaction to others. The father rejoiced over a repentant sinner. His son complained and was angry. The father welcomed the destitute. The son would have had him kicked out. The father was quick to forgive. He was ready to pardon. But his son was hardened against forgiveness. Bitterness had filled his heart. Father was giving, the son was stingy. The father was merry and joyful, the son was angry and resentful. Question for us today Are we a reflection of our Heavenly Father's heart? Do we rejoice over the things that He rejoices in? Do we love the things that He loves? Do we hear the words of Christ when he says, I must be about my father's business and say, that's my job now? Do we have a heart like the father? Are we ready and quick to forgive? Are we resentful and harboring bitterness? Do we have any love or joy to see a lost soul come to the Savior? Or are we complacent and never give a second thought? The word of God is clear if we love our father, we love our brother. 1 John 4, verses 20 and 21 says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. Yeah. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. What kind of love is he talking about? Just kind of some gushy, ushy feeling on the inside? No. He says, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. By what actions are you loving people? Jesus three times asked Peter a simple question. Peter, do you love me? Three times Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Three times the Lord Jesus Christ responded with this statement. Be my sheep. Minister to my people. Peter, if you love me, go and serve others. If I love my father, then I'll serve you. If you love your God, then it will be seen in your love for others. The Word of God tells us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the love of Christ. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, rejoicing with them that rejoice, weeping with them that weep, being of the same mind one toward another. We are our brother's keeper. What do our actions reveal about our love for Him and thereby our love for God? I was thinking on this this week and I thought of myself as a father and my relationship with my children. And you know what? I love it when my children love each other. Amen. It thrills my heart. 
I went home here earlier this week, and I think it was, I don't remember, this month, last, this past Monday night, and I went outside, and I watched my children, and of course, now I have this benefit, <clears throat> I've got several drives that make up my home, and uh, they got out there, and they were playing hockey in the street. There was enough of them that are big enough now, they were playing three on three. I've got another team of three on the way, you know? <laughs> These three, they are playing three on three out there. I mean, they were encouraging one another. Even little Sammy, he was out there. He was a goalie. He had this tennis racket he's trying to block stuff with. And they were just having a blast. And I heard the encouragement. And I just stood back and smiled. And I loved every minute of it. At the same time, I know this. And if anybody ever comes along and messes with my girl, she's got some boys that better be sticking up for her. Right. Or they're going to have a problem with their dad. Right. They'll be in just as much trouble with me as that guy that messed with her. Right. They better love their sister. They better take up her cause. Right. And likewise, she with them. They better stand up for one another. You know what? The Lord Jesus Christ said this. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you love one another. Amen. Just whose disciples does this world see us as being? Do they know that we're Christ's disciples because we love the brethren? You know, we look into this passage today. There's some reflecting we need to do. Because it's going to thrill our hearts to think about our Father loving us the way He does. But you know, there's some ways that we ought to respond. And there's ways that we'll reveal that love to others. The love that is Christ's love to us. Today we look into this passage of Father's love. And it's something inspiring. For me, it's something convicting. What's the Lord speaking to your heart about? I wonder, are you here today? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you ever responded to His love by reaching out and receiving what Christ has done? Do you know that you're saved? That you are born again? Look, this could be the last opportunity you have. Somebody just died just a few blocks from where I live this week. Got hit in a, in a vehicle accident. They died. And that could be any one of us. Have you known the Father? Do you know Him now? Will you receive Christ? The child of God, how are you responding to that love for you? Complaining and murmuring about the things in your life? Or are you rejoicing in all that He is and all that He has done? Are you showing that love to others? Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. So thankful for your word.